All right, let's, let's, let's give it a whirl. Uh, I think we're probably as close to having as many people. Uh, I'm Rich Giuliani of the Sociology Department. That's the least important thing you have to hear today. Uh, let's get quickly to the program because we want to devote as much time, allow as much time to uh, our two speakers. Uh, you're here for breakout session A. Is the capitalist system fundamentally flawed? Alternative models of capitalism and alternatives to capitalism. Uh, uh, if we need to, to uh, tie this into the larger program, uh, let me just pro forma say symposium sponsored by the University Partnership with Catholic Relief Services celebrating fifth anniversary this May. Catholic Relief Services is, of course, the official overseas humanitarian agency of the U.S. Catholic community, alleviating suffering and providing assistance to people in need in more than 100 countries without regard to race, religion, or nationality. Um, I'm asked to encourage you to attend the later session at uh, 4 o'clock, the two sessions uh, on the effectiveness of the, of the social safety nets, and the other session at 4 o'clock, what ordinary citizens can do as well as to encourage you to attend uh, the presentation this evening by the distinguished journalist, William Ryder, uh, who is with us this afternoon in this room here, too. Uh, the Next American Dream, uh, and to bring a few friends along with you. Uh, I'm sure that uh, this evening's uh, occasion will be a very memorable event for all of us here uh, on this uh, campus. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, try to uh, confine each of our presenters for uh, about a 25-minute uh, gig here, and then uh, to allow about 20 minutes for uh, your question and answer participation. Um, and, uh, uh, we'll see where that, uh, where that carries us. We're going to begin uh, with our first speaker being Professor Peter Zaleski, uh, Professor of Economics and Statistics here. Uh, member of the faculty since 1987, department chair since, uh, from 2002 to 2007, author or co-author of over 20 scholarly publications uh, after research that has focused on uh, how group size and concentration affect behavior such as in industrial lobbying, corporate uh, campaign con uh, contributing, charitable contributions, and business pricing strategies. Uh, his insights on, the, on these economic issues have appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer, in CFO Magazine, in the Christian Science Monitor. He has been heard on KYW Radio, on CNA TV. And uh, thanks, Dr. Giuliano. Um, I will start off by saying that I get to go first because of a coin toss. <laughs> Dr. McCarr won. That was <laughs> okay, that, that was my joke for the day. All righty. So I've been asked. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been assessed to uh, asked to assess capitalism, the capitalist system, as to assess uh, alternatives to the capitalist system, and to wrap that up as I start my watch here in 25 minutes or less. Uh, so as you can imagine, there's a couple things I'm going to assume that you know. A couple things I may have to gloss over. Uh, if I miss something that's unclear, by all means, there'll be a question session uh, at the end. If I feel rushed, it's because we're going to try to do a couple years' worth of work in 25 minutes. Okay, let's start off. We're, we're going to assess capitalism, um, and we throw these terms around. Let's, let's define terms, make sure we're all talking about the same thing before we decide if something's good or bad. Uh, let's start by defining capital. What is capital? I would define capital is the is the embodiment of past labor, right? So the, the machines we have, what were they? Things were produced in the past, and they now exist today. What can capital do? Capital can boost the productivity of current labor. So the capital we have today, how is that built, right? Things were produced in the past. We didn't consume it all. Whoever had produced it didn't consume it all. Save some of it. In, the, in, in a monetary system, right, that we saved in the form of money, right? That money was then spent by someone, build plant, machinery, equipment, something. In the case of students, we talked about student loans, you're investing in capital, you're investing in human capital, it's your know-how, your technology. But there's also physical capital, all the equipment we have, the factories we have. We usually think of capital as stocks, bonds, that's financial capital, which just simply represents an ownership of the physical capital, okay? So, who was the first capitalist? I think the first capitalist, probably the first caveman, that instead of sucking marrow out of a bone, decided to rub that bone against a rock and turn it into a spear. 
right? So now instead of having food today, he now has a tool that's going to help improve his productivity sometime in the future. And what was his, the first retirement plan? Well, you know, the caveman's getting a little old. He can't run with the hunters anymore. Here, take my spear that I made. I made that when I was a busy producer. And I didn't eat all that I, that I could at the time. You go. Makes you more productive. Tells the young hunters. That's going to make you more productive. Come back and, and let me have some of the food. That was his retirement plan. That was his savings towards retirement. Okay. So in his base, most basic essence, that's what capital is. Sounds kind of you know, archaic to what we have today. Today we have laptop computers. Now I was going to say handheld calculators, but that sounds kind of archaic already. right? We have laptop computers, flat screen television, automobile factories, jet factories. right? That's all capital equipment. Okay? So what's capitalism? Capitalism is a system that utilizes capital to produce output. Okay, so is that anything wrong with that? Uh, no. Well, there's different kinds of capitalism. I'll start at one end of the spectrum. What we'll call free market capitalism. So in the free market capitalism, individuals privately own their own capital. The individuals that own the capital decide what will be done with that capital, whether it works along, chugs along, works productively. Uh, and any transactions between individuals and society is, is mutually agreeable. It's, it's, it's a voluntary transaction between two parties. That's free market capitalism. Okay, how about, do we see that a lot today? Well, most of our glimpse of capitalism today might be what we call corporate capitalism. Okay, so now the capital that's necessary to produce an automobile is far greater than, than one individual might be able to do with their own individual savings. So folks, you know, collect their resources, gather up together, and they use that capital to, to basically have a group. They incorporate separately as themselves, and they now own the capital collectively. So now it's no longer you as an individual deciding how your capital gets employed. It's you collectively with a bunch of under, other individuals. Okay? Mm -hmm. They might not always agree, and you might have people that aren't really good experts. If they say, hey, you know, I have a lot of savings, don't know what to do with it. Hey, I'll buy, I'll invest in an automobile factory or something. Okay? So now here are these folks collectively. They decide to hire somebody. We'll call that person a CEO. And the CEO is now in charge of managing the capital on behalf of those shareholders. Okay? A couple problems arise. One is, how do you know the CEO is going to act in your best interest? There you are, shareholder. You've turned the company over to somebody, some complete stranger perhaps, and they're now managing your, that, that's your life savings now. They're managing that for you. And it's possible you may decide, hey, you know, we'll take turns as shareholders. I'll watch him one day to make sure he doesn't misbehave. You watch him the next, and so on and so on. The CEO shirks the day that I'm supposed to watch him because I shirked and didn't watch him. What are the profits off by? One over 365? What, a third of a penny? And I only and I own one one thousandth of the company, so I could shirk on my, my day to watch the CEO, and, and lo and behold, I'm not all that much hurt that much. Economists call that the free rider problem. We've got a large group of people, you know, no single individual has the incentive to do the particular task. I'll benefit from the work of the others. They'll monitor the CEO and that'll be fine. I'll take my day off. Of course, then what happens? Everybody thinks the same way. Nobody watches the CEO. Ah, solution. Board of directors. Smaller number of people. We'll have them watch the CEO on our behalf. Okay. Who's usually chairman of the board, though? The CEO. It's like hiring a babysitter. Say, come watch Johnny, and the CEO shows up. You say, do everything Johnny tells you to do. Right? So there's a little problem with, with that aspect of capitalism. Now, of course, the ownership, right, that can still trade back and forth, and that's still free market capitalism, swapping the share. So if the board of directors doesn't do its job, the CEO doesn't do its job, you know, the value of this capital is plummeting like crazy. Eh, somebody can come in in a free market system for the shares of the company, buy it up, <coughs> fire the band manager, kick out the board of directors. So, yeah, corporate capitalism has its inefficiencies, but if the market for ownership of that capital is still operating under free market capitalism, maybe we can sort of discipline those CEOs to make sure, hey, you know what, we're going to buy you out and fire you if, you if you don't behave. So you'll use my capital efficiently, even though... Uh, it may not be in your best interest. By the way, the other problem that, 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 that we had, I didn't use the term, but the, but the CEO may be not behaving, it's what we call the principal agent problem in economics. 
So the, the notion there is I own capital equipment, I hire an agent to manage it for me, the agent has his own set of preferences, I have my set of preferences, they may not always coincide. Okay. So that's an issue that, that maybe the monitoring resolves, maybe it doesn't, but push comes to shove, the threat of being taken over might, might keep that CEO in line. Okay. Next extreme, okay, as we move on that next level before we get to the furthest extreme, is what we'll call crony capitalism. Now we have, okay, we've got this the corporation controlling my, my capital, but lo and behold, the corporation, um, let's, let's put it tactfully, has perhaps a good relationship with government. So the corporation is able to get special contracts, the corporation uh, is deemed the winner, the corporation gets a bailout, the corporation is not allowed to fail. The government's making sure money's coming my way, okay? So it's capitalism, right? It's, we're still producing with capital, except now we've got some government involvement making sure that we do quite well. Of course, the key there, me as shareholders, at least my CEO or somebody, want to make sure that we're in, we have a good relationship with those in the government, okay? Then, the very next step, and once again, what have we done? We've taken that, that, that private ownership, private decision-making. Yeah, there's still private ownership, some of the decision making, we pushed it into the hands of the CEO, and now we've, we've pushed it into the CEO in, in compliance with, the, or I don't want to use the word cahoots, that sounds too strong, in compliance with, with the government. And then the furthest extreme would be some sort of government capitalism, social capitalism, Marxist capitalism. Marx was a capitalist, by the way, right? His title of his book was Das Kapital, right? So, it, right, so he's, he, he is a capitalist, but, it, but his view of capitalism is, a fun, is, is who owns the capital. It shouldn't be privately owned, it would be collectively owned. Okay? So that's another extreme form of capitalism. So if I'm asked to, to, to decide is capitalism fundamentally flawed, my first question is what type of capitalism are we talking about? Is it free market capitalism, corporate capitalism, crony capitalism, or Marxist capitalism? So I, I would, I would want to know for sure what we're, what we're talking about. Next step as an economist, I want to establish what are the criteria by which I'm going to measure uh, a, a system such as capitalism to determine is it flawed or not. And we usually use the typical three that we use in economics are, one, is the mix of goods and services that society produces, is that consistent with the mix of goods and services that consumers in society want to consume? Number two, what about the level of productive activity? Is it a high level of productive activity, a low level of productive activity? And then the third criteria would be the distribution of those goods and services. Who's getting all this output? So as I'm, gonna, I'm going to assess these systems, I want to assess them based on those criteria. Okay. In practice, in our country, we're a mix of systems that runs the full gamut. We have some sectors that, that are primarily free market capitalism, right? Who gets all the press? Corporate capitalism. Yeah, who gets maybe even a little more press too? Eh, we do have some shades of crony capitalism going on in this country. Not as severe as in other countries, as our earlier speaker pointed out. That, 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 that is one of the issues that takes place, the cronyism, the bribery, the graft corruption that keeps resources from getting to, to others. And then once again, some sectors in, in, our, in our U.S. economy are extremely heavily government controlled in terms of the allocation of resources. So we are a mix. So if we're going to say, uh, hey, something's bad with the U.S. economy, don't just assume that it's capitalism. It's maybe one of those aspects of capitalism and then figure out which one it is. Hey, about a month or two ago, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, anybody hear of him? He's not an economist. He was asked, how can you justify $20 million on one movie? And he, his answer was, and you would think, you know, these, these Hollywood types, they're not known for supporting free markets, but he gave the best free market defense I could have, better better than anyone I could have. He said, people are coming to the, to the theater to see me. That's what's bringing them in. They're, they're voluntarily buying tickets to come and see me. Yeah, I should get $20 million per movie. That's a free market economy. Hey, what if, what if we didn't have a free market economy? And, and what if instead we moved to some sort of centralized planning? And what if better still, what if I were the job czar? That would be the job I'd want to have if we were not a, a, a free market economy. And I would be Leonardo DiCaprio's job czar, and I would tell him what to do. I would have to say, you know what, these movies, they don't help anyone. You know, they're not, you know, it's, it's, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of people's energy, it's fiction, it's fantasy. What we need are economics professors. 
Right? We need a bunch of them. And that's what you're going to be. That's, what, that's where we need you. That's where society needs your activities. Okay? I'm the social planner. What happens? Who suffers? I think Leonardo DiCaprio is probably going to suffer. Right? He's not doing what he would rather be doing. Something he loves, something that I'm sure he's, he's good at. Moviegoers will suffer because they'll never get to see Leonardo DiCaprio on screen again. Uh, I'll bet economics students suffer because I'll bet he's not as good an economics professor as someone else would be. He's certainly not as good as, 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 a, as a movie star. Uh, and so there's a whole host of folks who are going to suffer, and I don't see anyone benefiting by, from me dictating, imposing my values on where Leonardo DiCaprio should spend his time. Another extreme case is probably the extreme case of social planning. Anyone familiar with the caste system in India? Uh, that's, so that's, that's as far removed from a free market system as you could get. Uh, about two years ago, Wall Street Journal uh, featured a fellow who was a member of the delete cast. Anyone, anyone know what level the deletes are? Is that the top level, mid level, bottom level? Delete, yep. That's the, yeah, you, yes, and your yeah. adjectives per. They are the bottom of the, if you're in the delete cast, you are the, the, the bottom cast system. Now, could you imagine what live, growing up in a cast system? A cast system is basically your life is dictated by what your parents have done, and their life is dictated by what their parents have done, and so on and so on and so on. So you can't just say, hey, that would be great. Let's have a caste system. My parents are millionaires. Right? No, no, no. We've got to go back a few years. Right? Everyone in this country now is the descendant of someone who came from this country right, who was somehow oppressed. Right? That's where we would be. We'd, we'd be the oppressed. We'd be the deletes. What happened in India? Okay, there's uh, off offshoring, a lot of businesses going to India. The Wall Street Journal features story about a fellow in the delete cast. His father's job was driving around the city collecting dead bodies and taking them to the morgue. That was this young fellow's fate because his job was to do his father's job. Okay, free market opens up, India, jobs, fellow smart enough, right? He studies and becomes a software engineer. Now he now he earns more in a month than his, he ever would uh, in a year uh, doing his father's job. One of the so two anecdotal evidence, of course, you know, two 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 observation points don't a case make. So let me go to some more uh, broader uh, examples of evidence. Go back to the mid 19th century, 1850s, U.S., Argentina, Brazil. Not a lot different. The economies of U.S. and Argentina didn't differ much in the mid-1800s. As we grew more along a market-based capitalist society, and they took on a more nationalist-based capitalist society, our standard of living outstrips theirs. Okay? So if you go back in time, we were pretty identical. Let's compare countries that socially, culturally would be identical, except their economic systems differ. North Korea, South Korea where average household income in the market-dominated economy is about 10 times higher than that in the government-controlled economy. East Germany, West Germany, now united, but when they were separate, the market-dominated economy, probably somewhere about three times the standard of living in the market-dominated country over the government-dominated country. Okay. So those are just a couple examples. Once again, I'm up against the clock, so I can't affect them down to 10 minutes now. So scarce resources, right? Yeah. Okay. So in terms of the mix of goods and services, yeah, do I value a DiCaprio film? No, I don't. If I were the job czar, would he be making films? No, of course not. But lo and behold, that's me versus 300 million people, right? Well, who am I to impose my values on the rest of the folks in the marketplace? Okay, so that's one. All right, number two um, is the levels. We looked across the different countries. Okay, number three, the distribution of goods and services. Sounds a little cold-hearted. Yeah, in the free market form of capitalism, you get rewarded for working hard. Okay, sort of ties into the mix part. Where am I going to put my capital and my labor efforts? Hey, what are the goods and services people value? Where am I going to be rewarded the most? That's where I'll work hard. Okay? If I don't have that market signal, if it's done bureaucratically, and once again, even inside a corporation that tries to bypass market signals, you'll see inefficiencies. And you see corporations die because they didn't listen to the marketplace. Okay? So in terms of the distribution, yeah, that's the cold-hearted part. I got to work hard. 
to save hard, right? <coughs> Who's doing well? China, we heard that in the earlier. What does China do differently than us? Savings, <coughs> right? So as you're getting, you're getting out of college and you think I have to pay off debt, sure, make sure you make time for that savings. Savings is what would give you the cushion in this crisis. So the crisis is a liquidity crisis, meaning I have no cash. Okay? But if you had socked away some savings, that would be your cushion, okay? Where's that savings come from? Working hard, living below my means. That's the, that's the cold-hearted part of the free market part that folks don't like. But that's the part that actually gets us to the level of output that we have. So when something does happen in Haiti, right, unfortunately, within a weekend, voluntarily, U.S. citizens donated $5 million over one weekend. So they're not all cold-hearted capitalists. Charitable giving is actually something that people do voluntarily. Here's my plug for Catholic Relief Services. Yes, I know they're my sponsor. That's great. And I love them for free market reasons. Number one, they're efficient. 93% of every dollar donated to Catholic Relief Services gets put to use. Right? Only 7% goes towards administrative and fundraising. Right? There's no way the federal government can match that record. Right? AARP, that number is 83%. Salvation Army, right? They're fit, right? That's 84%. Right? So from a free market perspective, I love Catholic Relief Services for their efficiency. Number two, they don't force me to give to them. I do so voluntarily. I'm not bragging, but everyone that gives to them does so voluntarily. Okay? Charitable acts do still occur in a free market economy. They're not going to go away. Okay? Like even I have the current corporate economy, right? There's, you work in a corporation, yeah, everyone's got to get that United Way folder passed around. We get that here, too. Okay. All righty. So I have about uh, oh, five minutes or so. So, okay. What are you getting so much from what I'm saying? Yeah, capitalism. There's some good. There's some bad. It seems that, that the market capitalism, the free market version of capitalism, seems to do pretty good. There's some harsh aspects to it. But in terms of the cr criteria established, it seems to do the best job so far. <clears throat> Corporate capitalism, as long as it's not shielded from market forces, can do okay as well. Crony capitalism, um, government planning forms of capitalism, social capitalism, those forms of capitalism do what? Do resources get put to the most efficient use there? What's my incentive? What's my incentive to, to put my resources to the most efficient use? Especially if, once again, I don't own resources personally. I don't get the rewards personally. I'll get a kickback maybe, because I'm the job czar. That'd be a good job. In fact, as job czar, I make myself job czar. There we go. <laughs> okay. So what happened? Market capitalism is so great. What happened in the U.S. in the last couple of years? We're crying out loud. Well, for starters, we're not primarily a free market society. We are a mixed society. There's, as I mentioned, there is this, this, this band, this continuum. Some sectors are purely free market. Other sectors go all the way to the other side, complete government control. So what, and, and I think over time, if, if you track the U.S. economy over time, you are seeing this move away from a free market society that you might have seen 100 years ago, right? Small shopkeep, small businesses, self uh, in, individual owners, small town bakery. You go through a small. What was what was the Andy of, Andy of Mayberry Griffith show? Floyd the Barber, Emmett the Fix It Man. Right. You had all those little shopkeeps. Right. You see that disappearing little by little. So free market capitalism, the small entrepreneur. You see that disappearing little by little. You see some aspects when you look at some of the some of the big news stories during the crisis, you do see some aspects of crony capitalism, okay? So you do see that movement. Uh, number two, it was touched on this morning, I'll, 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 this, earlier this afternoon, I'll touch on it again. Uh, I'm sure we're gonna hear a lot about it tonight as well. Uh, Federal Reserve policy. If you go back to throughout the 1980s under Paul Volcker, you saw a Federal Reserve policy that was fairly stable and predictable. And I divide Greenspan's term on the, uh, as chairman of the Fed uh, as, as Greenspan 1, Greenspan 2. Greenspan 1 looks very much like Paul Volcker in the sense that monetary policy continued to be fairly stable and predictable. By the mid to late 90s, we've got Greenspan 2. Now, I'm not sure what happened, and I can only speculate on what happened. I think Greenspan was already foreseeing his impending retirement, and he didn't want to go out on a recession. 
I could be wrong, completely bad. I, I actually ran this uh, uh, past a couple other folks. They think, ah, you're crazy. You, know, you think too much about these things. We had a re small recession in 01, right? And what did we have there? We, right, we, we had the bubble leading, we had the first stock price bubble leading up to that. We had a, another stock bubble and a housing bubble. We had, as was pointed out earlier, we had loose monetary policy, which was basically this. U.S. government issuing debt, borrowing money, issuing treasury security for sale on the open market. Federal Reserve Bank, which is technically a privately owned bank, it's, not a, it, it's somewhat government run, okay, reports to the government. Federal Reserve Bank buying up all this treasury debt by putting what into the economy? More money. Interest rates all right, at all-time historical lows. We saw, we saw the graph. So well, that's what we meant by loose monetary policy, right? Letting interest rates fall. Okay, cash is very cheap. I don't know how many, how many of you were getting credit card offers for zero percent for 12 months. I was bombarded with them. That's free cash. This is great. They're going to give me free cash. Great, because what interest rates are? What the interest rate is? What you pay for for the money that you're holding? Great. They're going to give me free cash. I'll take it. Well, at some point, the 0% goes away, the rate goes up, the deal goes away. Now I have to pay off the loans. During that time period, up until, and you can see things start to break in late 06, 07, household debt as a percent of household income, and we saw similar graphs earlier uh, in the day, went from about 14% of income, household debt percent of household income, about 14%, to up to about 20%. That's a 50% increase, going from 14% to 20%. Right? Historically, household debt was about 14% of income. This big jump starting in what I'll call Greenspan 2. Okay? That, I, 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 and I, I want to say that expansion or that fight from recession was leverage-based. There was nothing real behind it. If we go back to, say, the post-war boom, the post-war boom occurred, why? It wasn't the government spending during World War II. It was people cashing in their war bonds when they got home from World War II. It was a savings-induced boom. China's okay, no, relatively speaking. Why? Savings, okay? Our boom of the last 10 years was all leveraged, okay? That's a problem. The biggest problem occurs when asset prices fell. It's okay if asset prices are rising, but it's not a sustainable, it's not a sustainable boom. Because when asset prices, when you run out of money you can borrow, right? It's, 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 uh, it's no different than Bernie Madoff getting caught. When you get out of mo that money coming in, right, the, 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 the house of cards collapses. And, that's, and that was part of the problem. Was that capitalism? I don't know. Part of it was what? Fed-induced policy, right? That, that was interest rates being far lower than they should be. In a free market, what am I going to do? Hey, price of something goes down, I'm going to buy more of it. Interest rates are down, load me up on debt. <coughs> of course, that becomes unsustainable debt. Third thing, and I'll wrap up with two more. Third thing I think that was going on is, is I mean, and this is any system, whether it's a free market system, all the way down the line to government control. Every human <coughs> system suffers from imperfect information, imperfect knowledge. Right? When you're making a capital investment, what are you doing? You're making a prediction about the future. I'm buying this particular piece of equipment, machinery, because I'm predicting people are going to like the output. I'm going to be able to sell it. I'm going to be able to, to earn extra income from selling the product I make from this machinery. It may be a bust. I don't know. But there's no reason that a government planner would know any more than someone in the business would know. What would make that person know better as to what's a good investment versus what's a bad investment? So I don't know if I want to turn my, turn my investment decisions over to a central planner, okay? Um, and so that, that flaw is a human flaw. So is, is, is there a fundamental flaw? Well, there's a fundamental flaw in, pe in people. We're not prescient, we're not omniscient, okay? Fourth problem, and this is once again, I guess I'll speak to the students. Um, don't lose perspective. We really have lost perspective. We look at two data points and we claim there's a trend, right? We saw housing prices go up and we thought, oh, this is great, housing prices, oh, my house will be worth a million, my $200,000 house will be worth a million dollars next week at this rate, okay? And then, of course, housing prices fall. Oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm ruined. Well, no, 
right? The economy's cyclical. Things are cyclical. The whole reason things had to slow down was because people were over leveraged, right? Consumers had to catch their breath, right? There's an old saying, the Fed's job is to uh, take away the punch bowl when the party starts getting good. And here, we as consumers needed to catch our breath and Greenspan spiking the punch. All right. So there's a problem with that. All right. It wasn't our fault we got drunk. Now, I guess it was. We should have. Yeah, I guess that's, it wasn't all our fault we got. Yeah. There you go. Use that one and you go home. All right. Okay. But don't lose perspective. And here's the part for students. Study your history and your economics. Maybe, you know, maybe intro economics. Get your history. Don't let somebody tell you, hey, this system's great, this system's great, this system's great. Go study your history and look what systems were already tried in other countries where the standard of living is terrible and the system fell apart. And I'm way over time. Sorry. Before I introduce our next speaker, uh, the clipboard is still out there somewhere. Oh, you've got it over here. Okay, okay, for sure. Yeah, very good. Okay, thank you. All right, let's uh, move on. Um, Eugene McCarraher is associate professor of humanities and history and director of the graduate liberal studies program here. Received a PhD in U.S. cultural and intellectual history from Rutgers University. His study of liberal Protestant and Roman Catholic social and cultural criticism, Christian critics, religion, and the impasse in modern American social thought, it was published by Cornell University Press in 2000. He has also taught in history or religion departments at Rutgers, University of Delaware, and Princeton University. His scholarly articles have appeared in Modern Theology, the Journal of the Historical Society, and Religion and American <laughs> Culture. Uh, and in several book collections. He has written many essays and book reviews for Commonweal, Books and Culture, In These Times, The Nation, The Hedgehog Review, and The Chicago Tribune. He has been a fellow of the National Endowment for the Humanities and the American Council of Learned Societies. He is completing a cultural history of corporate business tentatively entitled <coughs> The Enchantments of Mammon, Corporate Capitalism and the American Moral Imagination. So thanks. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Everything he said is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so we can leave now. <laughs> um, I'm going to concede something at the outset. If you think that the purpose of an economy is making as many goods as cheaply as possible uh, and as many goods and services as cheaply as possible, capitalism is the system for you. There's simply no doubt that despite or precisely because of its ruthless concentration on profit and loss, capitalism has been the most productive economy yet created by humanity, if churning out lots of stuff is your criteria. Defined as simply the proliferation of consumer goods and services, the rising prosperity of the North Atlantic world over the last two and a half centuries is attributable in no small measure to the spirit and ingenuity of capitalist enterprise. Now, whatever equity and justice there's been, I would argue, is certainly not attributable to it, uh, but more on all of that later. Now, you don't have to be Milton Friedman uh, to affirm this. You could be Karl Marx, whose Communist Manifesto contains one of the most exuberant celebrations of capitalism in all of modern literature, and I would urge you to read it. You would think you're not reading Karl Marx when you read the opening pages. My basic point is going to be that, in a sense, it isn't the flaws of capitalism, but rather capitalism being its normal self that got us in the mess we're in. Unless it's rigorously regulated, or better yet, replaced by something else, we are going to land in something far worse. And that something else I would propose is some kind of, drum roll please, now, while the fundamental problem with capitalism is indeed, I think, moral and spiritual, I don't think it's proper to simply moralize about it. It's common to think that capitalism is about greed, selfishness, avarice, consumerism, etc., ad nauseum. Now, this is true as far as, as far as it goes, but I don't think it goes very far. Uh, and I'm not sure that it quite goes in the right direction. Greed has bedeviled us before capitalism, right? Jesus warned us about serving mammon before the advent of market society. Uh, and as a believer in original sin, I have to say that if you are waiting for the end of greed, well, you keep waiting. Uh, it's not going to happen until the kingdom comes. 
Um, as for consumerism uh, and this other word that gets associated with materialism, I'm tired of hearing about them. Uh, any good historian will tell you that consumer culture ha arose as a way of distracting people away from their lack of power and engagement in the workplace. Any history of consumer culture will tell you this. All right. I also think that complaining about consumerism has a certain kind of class bias, quite frankly. Um, especially this morning when some sort of a comment was made about, oh, all of those people buying granite tops uh, for their kitchens and so on and so forth. Well, that's what, that's what got people into their debt trouble, going to the mall too much. Well, let me cite Elizabeth Warren of the Harvard Law School, who has uh, demonstrated that the single largest cause of personal and household bankruptcy in this country is not people going to the, to the mall, it's medical bills. Medical bills. Not granite tops, not SUVs, medical bills. As far as I'm concerned, talking about consumerism is a way of not talking about capitalism. I think I agree with Pete on one thing, though, uh, and it's crucial to define capitalism. So let me first define what it isn't. It's not just the free market. Societies had markets before capitalism. And as I'll explain in a moment, markets perform a specific function in capitalism that they don't perform in other economic systems. Moreover, the degree and nature of the freedom that you have in the free market system is precisely one of the things that's being argued about. Similarly, capitalism is not just the search for profit. Merchants and moneylenders took profits in ancient Rome, medieval Bruges, and Renaissance Florence, but they were not capitalists. Also, capitalism is not just the accumulation of wealth, or more specifically, the accumulation of surplus. Accumulation took place in Middle Kingdom Egypt, classical Athens, and Bourbon France, orders in which any sort of surplus that did exist was usually appropriated by ruling classes for their luxury or their military power. And besides, unlike Tyler Durden in Fight Club, who admonishes us to forsake shit we don't need, I don't see anything inherently insidious about the accumulation of surplus. If producers consumed everything they produced, there would be no enlargement of productive capacity. There's no development of new technologies, no treasury of art, literature, science, and everything that comprises culture and civilization. In other words, human beings are creatures who create surplus by their very nature. And the accumulation of surplus is going to take place under any imaginable economic order. Capitalism is also not just private property. And I think it's that consideration that takes us to the heart both of what capitalism is and of why it's fundamentally flawed. Capitalism is first, last, and foremost a system of property relations between producers and appropriators. Throughout history, property relations have entailed producers and appropriators. In other words, classes. Those who make goods and services and those who control the production and distribution of those goods and services, either by owning the means of production or by enlisting overt means of coercion. Under the property or class relations of pre-capitalist societies, for instance, masters or overlords used superior political and military power to force producers to surrender some part of their surplus labor and production. The differences in those forms of coercion mark the differences in those economies. In chattel slavery, for instance, producers themselves are owned by masters, while in feudalism, nobles coerce serfs to perform labor on some part of the manor and surrender a portion of their production. Now, under capitalist property relations, the dominant form of appropriation is based on legally free producers who are completely dispossessed from the means of production. Slaves are owned. Serfs and peasants have direct access to their own means of production. They can walk out of the hut and start work anytime they want, so long as the Lord gets his due. In capitalism, Owners determine access to the means of production 
even if they wanted to, in other words, workers can't just go into the office or factory and start working. Unlike chattel slaves or serfs, producers under capitalism are legally free, and their surplus labor and production is appropriated by the capitalist owner by economic means. There's no overt compulsion. Overt compulsion in the relationship between producer and appropriator. Because direct producers or workers are propertyless, they don't own the means of production, even to the means of their own labor, it's the sale of their capacity to labor, which the capitalist wants to purchase as cheaply as possible so, have, so as to have the maximum left over for investment. Now this unique, and I want to emphasize, this is unique, this is new, this is what makes capitalism different from earlier economic systems. This unique relationship between propertyless workers and propertied appropriators is mediated by the market. Capitalism follows certain laws of motion that distinguish it from other forms of economic life. That's why capitalism has not existed from the beginning of history. It begins at a specific historical moment. The imperatives, I'm emphasizing these words for, for a reason, the imperatives of competition and profit maximization, the necessity to reinvest surpluses in production, and a systematic requirement to improve labor productivity and to develop technology. These laws of motion are enforced by the market, which serves, as I said, a very distinctive and historically specific function in capitalism. It mediates access, not only to ordinary goods, but to the very means of production themselves. Almost everything in capitalism is produced for the market. Both capitalists and laborers, both capitalists and laborers, are utterly dependent on the market for the most basic conditions of life. Workers depend on the market to sell their capacity to labor as a commodity. Capitalists depend on the market to buy this capacity to labor, to purchase means of production, and to realize profits by selling the goods or services produced by workers. Thus, capitalism is by its nature an inherently unstable, dynamic, and conflictual system. And thus, class struggle is endemic to it, rooted in the very nature of capitalist property. It isn't, class struggle is not some big misunderstanding and it's not the product of envy or resentment on the part of workers. <clears throat> Ask Warren Buffett, who breezily informed the New York Times a short while ago, well, of course there's a class struggle, and my side is winning. I want to underline two aspects of capitalism here. The coercive nature of its property relations, and the competitive character of the social life that it generates. The mythology of capitalism abounds in the language of freedom. We speak of the free market, the creation of opportunity, the <coughs> proliferation of choices, the opening of countries to trade. The opening, by the way, often achieved by gunboats. Yet we also speak of market forces. And forces, the last time I looked in the dictionary, is about compulsion. What I think needs to be clarified is that the distinctive and dominant characteristic of the capitalist market is not opportunity or choice, but compulsion. Despite the appearance of freedom and equality in the wage bargain, for instance, the worker is free to choose or reject the terms of employment offered by the owner. The owner's complete control over access to the means of production puts him at a decisive advantage. By the same token, one of the provisions of that wage-labor relationship is that the product does not belong to its producer. It is surrendered to the owner of the resources. What you get as a worker is a wage, a payment. You give up legal ownership of your product. At the same time, the capitalist imperatives of a competition, accumulation, and profit maximization mandate mandate 
that owners acquire and seek to enlarge their control, not only over the means of production, but over workers. No matter how nice and affable and cultivated they are, they must resist and bust unions. They must utilize technologies that render workers cheaper, more pliable, or obsolete. They must oppose any effort on the part of the state to regulate the conditions under which they extract as much surplus as they can out of workers, regardless of how inhumane, socially irresponsible, or ecologically destructive those activities could be. It really needs underlining right now that the only justice and equity workers have ever achieved in capitalist nations has been acquired painfully and often against great violence through unions, left-wing parties, and a generous welfare state. They have not been granted by tender-hearted capitalists, <coughs> which is why, contrary to the some in the business school, socially responsible capitalism is pure twaddle. <laughs> it's essential to point out, I think, that capitalism did not appear in history as the free decision of uncoerced men and women. The history of capitalism is a long and ongoing tale of dispossession and violence, beginning with the confiscation and sale of monasteries in the 16th century, the enclosure of common lands, meaning the eviction of peasants from land, in the 17th and 18th centuries, the imperialist invasion and forcible transformation of numerous societies, beginning with Ireland in the 16th century. The creation of American capitalism required the removal and destruction of Native American tribes. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the trade in African slaves provided considerable startup capital for North Atlantic manufacturing, and plantation labor serviced the commodity markets in London and Amsterdam. Understanding capitalism as a system of imperatives helps explain why, far from being an anomaly or a perversion, our current economic turbulence is a textbook case of capitalism being capitalism. The media focus on the Bertie Madoffs of the world obscures the fact that this is not a financial crisis or the result of bad apples. It's a systemic tremor that's been in the making for the last four decades. So going back to 2007 will not explain this. Go back to 1973. Beginning in the 1970s, corporate capital basically began to remake the economy in a way that landed us in the mess we're in. Rising energy costs and increased international competition forced and enabled corporations to do something they'd been desiring to do for a long time, destroy the New Deal, and especially destroy the New Deal arrangements which characterized the U.S. economy since 1945 and which contributed to the longest and most equitable distribution of productivity in the history of capitalism. So, hooray, welfare state. The introduction of computerized production and communication technologies enabled management to accelerate automation and introduce more intensive labor practices, which, of which you will be the great beneficiaries. New management and production practices emphasized flexibility of labor. In other words, no unions. The result? Well, to cite one very illuminating statistic, in the 1990s, productivity per worker hour rose four times as fast as the average hourly wage. In manufacturing, that's 20 times as fast. With weak unions and strong bosses, Productivity growth shows up in the, in the pockets of executives, stockholders, and bank creditors. Mutual fund directors and other institutional investors reasserted stockholder claims. Mergers and acquisitions placed financial over productive prowess. Financiers acquired a historically unprecedented role in corporate governance. Employers, meanwhile, hold down wages and benefit levels while governments slashed social expenditures across the North Atlantic. <coughs> this led to a protracted sluggishness and demand, artificially stimulated and camouflaged until very recently by an enormous explosion of government, corporate, and household debt. This is where I must take issue with what Professor Toyota said this morning. 
The drop in wages is absolutely central to understanding this crisis. This is not just a financial mess. This is a systemic problem that we are in. Unable to find outlets for surplus in the realm of production, corporations and institutional investors poured it into financial markets, speculating in mergers, acquisitions, and asset prices. To accommodate all this deluge of money, finance capital conjured ever more arcane forms of pecuniary sorcery. Options, derivatives, and other kinds of securitization that we've all come to know and lament. And all of this depended on the policies of the state, which from Reagan right down to Obama has adopted the neoliberal triad of deregulation, lax enforcement, and bailout. Note well, the problems began not in finance, but in the property and class relations of production, where the imperative of accumulation required not only downward pressure on wages and benefits, but the redirection of that surplus into exotic financial speculation. In other words, the mess we're in is the inexorable product, not of any malfeasance, but of adherence to the imperatives of capitalism. The flaw here is also not discrimination, or to use a term I really loathe, uh, classism. Discrimination on the basis of race, religion, gender, or sexual orientation is certainly reprehensible, but it's not endemic to capitalism. Capitalism can function, can function perfectly well without racism, sexism, homophobia, or religious bigotry. In fact, capitalism has arguably contributed to the mitigation or the destruction of these injustices. What it can't function without is class which is why classism is such a pale and milquetoast substitute for using a word like exploitation, which is a word we should be hearing a lot more of. Classism conveys the sense that the problem is prejudice or stereotypes about the working class of the poor, and that the solution lies in freeing your mind of these stereotypes, which is a form of righteousness which is usually quite well suited to liberals with stock portfolios. As I've suggested, class, which means class struggle, is a simply indelible feature of the system. It's not a matter of prejudice or a matter of misunderstanding. It's there. That's why capitalism's most basic flaw is its promotion of competition. Capitalism, I think, has an essentially martial con uh, conception of human affairs. It's a just war theory of economics in which men and women become soldiers of fortune, steeled against casualties and collateral damage. Now, apologists for capitalism will, of course, maintain that competition is the lash that compels firms and individuals into efficiency and innovation. But efficiency under capitalism is about the cost of production. And as I've said, the pressure here is ultimately about exercising more control over workers either through technology or new managerial technique, or through shedding workers altogether. At the same time, innovation, at least at the point of production, is also about gaining more control over workers. While at the point of marketing, it's often about the creation of wants and needs that turn social life into a battleground of consumption and emulation. Either way, human beings end up treating others at best as strangers or at worst as enemy combatants in the market of all against all. <clears throat> That's why I propose that friendship rather than competition should be our model of economic life. And friendship given political form is democracy. In other words, collective deliberation over our common life. Socialism is the extension of democracy to economic life the economy of friends. Now, I'm certainly not going to deny that socialism has had, to say the least, a very rocky historical career. But I still think that that old socialist ideal is worth our allegiance and our energy. Ownership and control of the means of production by the workers themselves. One of the most disturbing features of our political culture today, I think, is the disappearance or atrophy of the conviction, especially among the young, 
that something other than capitalism is possible. It used to be said that young people demand too much and that they want the world to change too quickly. My fear is that today you demand much too little, that you're unwilling or unable to imagine and insist on a different kind of world. There's a problem with change you can believe in if you don't really believe in very much. Perhaps you're afraid. You have good reason to be. But especially if you don't confront the crisis of the basis of our century's <coughs> impending economic and ecological turmoil, which is, truth be told, in large measure, this capitalist system. And the only way out of capitalism and toward any sort of an economy of friends is through solidarity and struggle in love. That kind of stark political realism isn't popular today. It must become popular again. But as Warren Buffett would remind you, the struggle is already here. You don't have to start it. It's there. And the point is how you go about waging and winning it. Waging and winning this kind of struggle does not require violence. And I would personally recommend the Sermon on the Mount as a code of revolutionary discipline. Essential not only to effective action, but to action that is worthy of us and of the end we seek. As always, it seems to me the only way to the promised land is to lock our arms, raise our voices, and march. Approximately 20, 25 minutes or so for questions and answers. Please go ahead. Um, I was glad you mentioned the need for social justice, and uh, also that you mentioned the New Deal. And mm -hmm. here at a Catholic University, I'd like to remind everybody that the principles of the New Deal came from Rara Navarum, Carter Justin Ohano, and from a uh, professor priest, Thomas Ryan, at Catholic University. And uh, they were great believers in the dignity of work and um, supported labor unions. So I just want to say that being here at a Catholic University, because I find a lot of Catholics don't think that way anymore, and it bothers me. If I may. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, any, any of you out here who uh, say are in the business school, I don't know if you are, but um, you're often given advice that you should be, I don't know, social entrepreneurs or whatever. Don't be a social entrepreneur. Become a labor organizer. You want to really do good for the world? It's unromantic. It's ill-paid. You might get your head beaten in. But you're doing a lot, a lot more good for the world, uh, I think, as a labor organizer than you would as uh, any sort of social entrepreneur. Uh, yeah, the labor movement definitely needs all the help it can get uh, right now. But yeah. Go ahead. Uh, my question kind of was a good follow-up to that. Um, you paint this very conf conflictual, I guess, picture of capitalism. Um, and I'm interested to get both of your perspectives on how becoming a more service-based economy and becoming an economy that is um, highly dependent on very educated persons changes that relationship. For example, when you look at um, technology companies such as Google, you know, you say innovation is, at the heart of innovation, it means um, the owner trying to get more control, right, over the workers. But when you look at some of the practices of these companies, uh, my husband is in the IT field, these are companies that are actually, in a way, um, you know, giving um, incentives such as, like, profit sharing. So if someone at Google, for example, contributes and makes, um, make some kind of invention or innovation, how Gmail got started, they actually share in some of the profits of that. They give their workers tremendous freedom when it comes to how they spend their work day, um, you know, what days of the week they work, um, I, I hope getting, un, because they understand, I think, in essence, that um, creating a, a positive and rewarding work environment for the workers is actually going to reap them a greater benefit and has, you know, so far been a model that's worked. So I wonder how, you know, what you think about how this transition to to a service-based economy in which people are more educated, changes that relationship between the worker and you know the owner of the means of production, if you, if you will. First. Well, 
Yeah, I, um, I, would, I would take issue with your characterization of service labor. Uh, one of the problems with the way service labor often gets described is that uh, we take as the model, uh, you know, hip, urban, Google uh, workers who, uh, you know, sit in Starbucks and work, okay? <laughs> this is not the way most service labor is. If you want a picture of service labor, go to Walmart. And there's an excellent book on this, which has just appeared. I would highly recommend it by Bethany Morton, um, to serve God in Walmart. And that sort of service labor is much more, uh, that, that characterizes service labor much great, much more than um, the sort of IT-based model that you're mentioning. And in there, in Walmart, uh, there is an incredible amount of managerial control mm -hmm. over, over workers. Uh, and even in many IT-based companies, uh, to the extent that I've done research on this, uh, there are new sorts of managerial techniques that are being developed to control these workers as well. Uh, mainly through technology. Uh, it's, not, it's not often, we don't think enough about the fact that computer technology is also a surveillance technology. So even the hip young worker right in Starbucks is being surveilled. It just seems to me that the trend in, in managerial thinking, like I just think, you know, I, I, I totally understand it and, and agree with you know, that, that there is this element of capitalism, right, which is like the worker versus, you know, the owner, you know, the poor versus the rich. I mean, it, there's, there's that element to capitalism, but it also feels like to think of it only in that terms is an oversimplification. And there are, with, within a capitalist system, you know, employers, right, and who, who you know, do, view, do understand, right, that it's in their best interest. And, and especially now that our, our workforce is becoming more and more educated. And so there's this dependency, right, on the highly educated people. And, they, and, and those highly educated people tend to understand their own power, I guess, as well. But there's a change I'm not in the sure they do. There's a change in the dynamics. Um, and, and the trend is, you know, is, I guess, it, mostly in, in industries that rely on highly educated employees well, to change the way management and, and the relationship that we're in. Well, let me address this, address this as if we were our own little company right here, and we will be a social democracy of friends. Now, there's two problems inherent with that. One is, I alluded to earlier, is this free rider effect. Some of you will say, I'm going to take the benefits of this group without pulling my share of the cost of this group. Mm -hmm. And then the other problem is the heterogeneity of our ideas. You may want to do one thing with the communal capital we own. I may want to do another thing with the communal capital that we own. I don't know how we're going to reach a, a fair decision on that. So here's what's going to be the problem. Someone will, it's an unstable system, someone will evolve as the leader, right? Look at Soviet Union, Russia. It was this communist, it was a social system. Someone evolves to be the leader that will then control. We ha we're going to have the same conflict. It's not capitalist versus labor conflict. It's going to be political class versus everyone else. That, and if you want to join the political class, if you can join the political class, you will then become one of the favorite ones. As the capital labor folks feel, that's the conflict. Here's the difference in the market system. There's nothing keeping a laborer from becoming a capitalist. All I have to do is save a little bit. Well, and all I have to do is get an idea. It's not that simple. It is that simple. It is I've that tried, simple. My husband and I have tried to start our own business. It's not as simple as, you know. You're using one observation. Okay? You look theory, at. I agree with you. Let, let, let's look at, and okay. once again, I look at industries where I think people are exorbitantly paid. But in a free market system, look at athletes and entertainers that came out of poverty, dire poverty. Okay? That at any time, kind of social planning caste system, the die is cast for them. They will never get out of that poverty. So that, that so so yes, as, as a labor, you can and will someday, and maybe if you don't start your own business, if you say the typical shareholder of corporate America is some guy around sixty years old who's who's, you know, he made household incomes about seventy five thousand and he's starting to plan retirement. It's it's not it's not Warren Buffett versus a bunch of workers. Warren Buffett is, is the atypical shareholder. He's not the typical shareholder. He's not the typical capitalist. Okay. In, in terms of these companies, now here's one of the distribution of income is, an, is a topic that, that came up earlier today. 
we are becoming, we're not only, we've moved away from a service economy, we're becoming a knowledge economy. Education is the coin of the realm now, okay? Knowledge is the coin of the realm. If we lose manufacturing business to China in an open market global economy, are we broke? No, we are, we, we are the idea engine of the world. That's, now the problem is, unfortunately, sadly, we have folks not keeping up with education, folks falling behind in education. That's our comparative advantage. We have too many folks falling behind that area. Go ahead, please. Okay, I have a dual question. Um, when I was in the 1960s in our church, we um, took care of migrant children so that the mothers and the uh, older kids could go out and pick in the fields. And I remember self-righteously feeling you know, quite good about this. My father said I would be willing to pay more for my tomatoes so that those women could watch their own kids. Now, I'm thinking that our service, that our Medicaid and welfare and all that helps to support, you know, these industries that pay less than labor is worth. I now work in a school district where most of the parents have two jobs, both parents, and they still can't make it. And I know, I'm a school psychologist, I know that when kids have multiple risk factors, the probability of them coming out of poverty is very slim. We, I mentored a kid from age five, he's now getting a master's degree. I can tell you that what you need to do to get kids up is to do what you do with your own personal children, which is to invest money. We sent him to a private school outside of the city, we paid for his college, that's what parents do. These kids in the ghetto, and this kid came from extreme poverty, don't have that opportunity, and we're not doing it as a nation, and I think poverty is proliferating in this country because of our lack of love. Well, so something like school vouchers would be a perfect opportunity to say, hey, you don't have to send your child to the public school. President Obama does not send his children to the public school systems in, in Washington, D.C. He's wealthy enough to be able to send his kids to the private school. Why can't those other kids that live in Washington, less fortunate, through vouchers, instead of being forced, right, coerced to go to a certain school, give them the well, option, give them the choice. Because in a city of a concentration of poverty, I don't know where they go. The real estate agents, in my view, are primarily responsible for the public school system's failure in this nation. The, the what? The real estate. Yeah, I, I think that what actually your your uh, your remarks underscore is is the need for universally based programs of all kinds. Uh, one of one of the, I, one of the ra one of the ways in which I think liberals and other progressives, whatever the nomenclature is now, uh, one of the direction one of the bad directions they take they took uh, over the last thirty to forty years. Was to was to have certain kinds of programs targeted at specific groups, rather than making the argument in universal terms, and saying, uh, for example, one of the reasons you should have universal health care, or maybe you should have even universal pension system, is that it's for everybody. Now, Pete might say, well, isn't isn't Ross Perot or Warren Buffett going to have a free rider program? You know what the proper response to that is? I don't care. <laughs> I don't care if Ross Perot or Warren Buffett gets free health care, as long as everybody else gets it. No problem. Let him let him ride freely. But see, well, it wouldn't be. Someone has to pay. It's free well, if right. the doctors okay. and nurses don't get paid. But, but in other that words, would be free health care. But in someone other words, has to pay them. Right. But in other <laughs> words, we are not. We we are breaking the link between income uh, and and medical access to medical care. We're breaking the the link between employment and and medical care, which is what we should when do. When people, well, here's, here's the problem: people don't face the price of something. You see it in California. California's very social policy group. Uh, students that get this bill, of students, they raise this tuition in the California State uh, uh, University system. It's going to hit about ten thousand dollars, and the students are protesting. That's what happens when you cut the link between price. They have, what's their solution? They, they protest. You guys are paying, what, about 50 grand? At the university, those are public schools. Yeah. The California state system. But, is, I'm saying, it still costs about $40,000 to educate a, a student. 30 of that 10 is coming from taxpayers. Go ahead, please. I'm, I shouldn't oh, jump in because right. I get to talk tonight, but I'm fascinated. <laughs> this is a wonderful, no, no. wonderful conversation, by the way. I'm having a great time. <laughs> now, I want to go back to what she was talking about in your response. And I'm a reporter. I've been a reporter for many decades. 
and have seen so much of what you both describe and you as well. I always, and I agree completely with your analysis of the class struggle at the core of everything, I always, always have avoided <coughs> using that framework when I write about it, and, and not for ideological reasons, but for this per reason. I've done a lot of reporting inside big corporations. I wrote a book on the global economy and my financial stuff. It's all based on people who do it, who are strategists, etc. And what I've run into invariably inside these big companies, at least, is that they have about the same set of complaints that, that the working class has alongside them and on the shop floor. And the, the gulf between them is partly a, a, a concoction of culture and class and everything, but it's, it's not as real as people imagine. And so I want to see a, a resolution that doesn't divide them in half, that in fact recognizes there are certain rights pretty close to what you're describing that I would want to see every employee, every worker, whatever, whatever their status, and then some form of, I, I'd like to hear more about you know, well, how, how what, you deal what, with that, because well, class struggle, I think, throws a lot of people off <coughs> for other reasons, but it, but it stops me for that reason. Like the kind of balance that I think like the rewards for for taking risk, you know, and trying to start a business or the rewards that go to the owners of production legitimately, but balancing, right, the, the needs and legitimate rights of workers to Well, have. giving them real rights. Right. I mean, really, really, I'll have to get into this tonight. I don't want to get into it now, but I just... In giving workers <clears throat> There were a number of people well, that had their hands up a moment ago, and I wanted to. I'm to, sorry, to I didn't kind of can't. No, 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 that was fine. Uh, the, the, right here, please go ahead. First. I was, <clears throat> was going to ask um, about the talk. It seems like there's a culture of incentives. For example, if I, if I, for example, come from the ghetto and I end up, um, I guess, getting an ed education at Villanova and become rich, then what? Why should I want to help the poor people? come from where they came from. So I think that I want... I want. Why don't you think you should? Because if I, if I fought so hard to come from where I came from, so why, why should I then... I, I can attribute my making it to hard work, you know, the capitalist... Um, what, what was being said before about opportunity and freedom. So it seems like what you, were, you, you said that um, young people are becoming complacent. But it seems like what ha ends up happening is that you have a lot of optimists who e who come into th into the school system and then they get churned out like a s like sort of like a wheel and once once you come at the once once you get outputted it seems like the incentives that are faced so sort of outweigh. Hey, let me interject before you do your answer. You'll be amazed once you start doing well how much good you want to do when you have the when you have those resources. You look at the Bill Gates Foundation. You'll be amazed at how generous you become. I wasn't when just you speaking. I wasn't just right. speaking from like a racial perspective. I was speaking more from no, in like general. In general, in general even yeah. like when well, you people that do well do good, they do. Is that where charitable contributions are down from corporate America? Actually, it's being crowded out by the government redistribution okay. programs. I think one way one way that I might answer your question <laughs> is is to uh, say what what many people before you said, and I, what I mean by that is historically. Right. This was one of the justifications in the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries. You know, I worked hard. I worked out of poverty. I made it myself. No, you didn't. You did not do anything by yourself. Nobody did. That's a generic you. Okay. You had institutions. You had uh, the people in those institutions. You had a general institutional framework, whether it was in the 18th, 19th, or 20th century, that enabled that to happen. Right. So I don't believe in the self-made man myth. Nobody is self-made. Yeah, what I was saying was that um, people equate what when they make it to, to being self-made, but um, I don't know, it seems like the incentives when, when one gets an education sort of outrank the common good. It seems like, I don't know, well, what, how can you, how can you, because capitalism is entrenched in society the way it is right now. How can you like? It will be as long as you. Say how can that. you equate that to, to love? I don't know. It seems like. Well, you're, we're looking at different. We're looking at 
how do things get produced? Because we have to feed people, we have to clothe people, we have to provide them shelter, right? I don't, I'm, I'm not a free market person within my family, within my community, within the goods and services that have to get produced, yes. But there's relationships you're gonna have and establish where you help people voluntarily. It, it, it does, have, and it's not that I'm saying we compartmentalize, is that it, the fact that you will have more wealth will allow you to do more with that wealth. There are a few questions in the back, and I, I think we really want to hear from people uh, before we break up. So go ahead, please. Yes, go ahead. Um, you said that the labor movement was in 1973. Mm -hmm. um, so something must have failed about the labor movement. What was it? Ronald Reagan. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's a flip answer, but it's a very important one. Ronald Reagan. Uh, the, well, I mean, I, there were two things I'd mentioned. Ronald Reagan, and what I mean by that is a certain kind of political climate. Uh, not just here, I mean, Margaret Thatcher, uh, you know, the, the remaking, basically, of even social democratic parties and their movement to the right. Um, so there's a certain kind of political climate uh, often called the Washington Consensus, right? But um, so you got that, which makes then the next thing I'm going to say even easier to do, which is the development of you know what some scholars would call post-Fordist capitalism, right? So in other words, you get a form of capitalism which um, is more you know IT based or you know service economy based uh, for one thing, and it's actually. Lab labor unions, I think, have to take some of the blame for this, for not uh, being imaginative and creative enough to figure out how are we going to organize workers in these industries, right? Uh, they've done a very bad job of that. And, and for allowing their own members and the children of their membership for coming to the conviction that I made it all on my own and forgetting their own history of what brought their prosperity down to that's a disaster. Last question, Marcus, please. I gotta, Always uh, provide. Question, you, I mean, do you think they're bleak uh, a view on, on things that might be in? Oh, I'm not. I'm not kind of bleak. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm full of hope. That you're two things: Marxist and American. Uh, Understood. In, in the sense that I mean. If, if you look historically, right, I mean, I'll, I'll grant you for, for the sake of this argument that capitalism is exploited. Historically, what followed very shortly after the rise of capitalism is democracy. That is, the... Bourgeois capitalist democracy. Yes. Well, okay, I mean, if that's your take, then, then you have a slightly naive view of, 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 of how democracy works, right? No, I mean, seriously. Why, why is it naive? Why is it naive? Yeah. Because the, the bourgeois democracy basically think, I mean... Bourgeois, you mean the bourgeois democracy in England, for example, that required at least three or four different acts to include a greater suffrage? Yeah, well... You mean was, the was, bourgeois democracy in the United it, States? I think of the democracy okay. that brought national health care. I think of the, the uh, bourgeoisie that, you know, uh, reduced income inequality. I think of the, right. the bourgeois... That, that regulated I, the, the workplace. You know, I have nothing they, against bourgeois democracy sorry? when it does what it should. Well, I have okay. nothing against bourgeois democracy when but it does it's what it should. But then it's all bourgeois democracy. It's democracy that serves everybody, okay. not just the, it's not okay. the class Okay, Marcus, we don't have an argument here. <laughs> <laughs> See what Dr. Dr. Toten tells me we must end in order to make the next session uh, possible. But I would suggest that maybe we all reconvene.